Good evening. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, first, a little business to get out of the way. Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may, sh may share the same view as the speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event respect the right of the speaker and the organizing student group to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. At the conclusion of this event, there will be a question and answer portion during which you may ask questions and engage in dialogue. Be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. <laughs> in the interest of time, we ask that each student be concise and ask only one question. I would also ask that students ask questions first and then we will turn to the rest of the audience. With that, I will turn it over to Dean Michael Bailey. So uh, good evening, my name is Michael Bailey. I'm the interim dean here at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown. Um, so I'm really, really excited to uh, be introducing uh, this evening's event. And I, I, the um, thing I wanna emphasize uh, in this introduction is that, that here at McCourt and here at Georgetown, we really aim to be a hub of interesting and meaningful engaged conversations. And so I think it's really cool that this particular event um, is bringing together Institute of Politics and Public Service, a, a uh, institute uh, uh, in McCourt School, also known as GU Politics, and the New York Times, and so that we're getting kind of two audiences and mixing things uh, in interesting ways. And, you know, we have some pretty good uh, material to work with tonight, as you know, um, as we will have Sally Yates talking about the independence of the judiciary, uh, constitutional law, civil rights, criminal justice, uh, prison reform, and more. Um, so, uh, really, that's kind of what I have in terms of just want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, welcome you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Max McGid, who's a junior in the college. And one of the things I here I also want to emphasize is how uh, amazing the opportunities we have here for, for students of all levels, from undergraduates to uh, graduate students as well, to be really involved in, in um, uh, just really amazing stuff. And so, so Max is part of... Uh, um, one of our uh, uh, geopolitics student advisory boards. And so th this event is, is, a, is a pretty neat thing, um, but there's lots of things going on on a day-to-day -day basis where students are be able, uh, able to be involved with, uh, you know, policy makers, policy questions, uh, and so forth. So it's a really neat opportunity uh, for them and for us. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Max. Hi, I'm Max Baggett, a junior in the college. Uh, I'm also a member of the GU Politics Student Advisory Board. I got involved with GU Politics as a freshman, helping set up for events with the special ops team. I wanted to quickly encourage all of you uh, to get involved with GU Politics and let you know a few of the ways you can do that. Um, you can uh, follow along online tonight by using um, the hashtag Yates at GU. Also, you can volunteer for our special ops team, which is how I got started, helping set up for great, great events like this. Um, you can also uh, do, uh, go to events just to see what we're doing and um, go to our fellows program uh, and their office hours. Um, we hope you'll find a way to get involved and stay involved, and if you want any more options, check out our website. Um, Thanks for coming, and I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer Steinhauer to introduce our guests for this evening. Hi, good evening. I'm Jennifer Steinhauer, Director of Live Journalism here in Washington for the New York Times. It's great to see all of you here tonight for this very timely and important discussion about the rule of law in the United States. I wanted to give a special welcome to New York Times subscribers and thank you for your role in making our journalism happen. This evening's discussion has been brought to you by the New York Times Subscriber Events Program, which brings our readers behind the scenes at the New York Times. Last year, we presented 150 programs and opportunities to engage with our journalists, and you'll be getting an email to learn about how you can enjoy more of those. But tonight, we're very pleased to welcome to the stage Sally Yates, a former United States Attorney and later Deputy Attorney General appointed by President Barack Obama. 
Last year, she was fired as acting attorney general for refusing to enforce President Donald Trump's travel ban, which she called a moment when the law and conscience intersected. Here to discuss this is someone who knows the conundrum well, having covered the Justice Department under five attorney generals. He has played a role in several New York Times scoops this year concerning the Robert Mueller investigation and its impact on the White House. So please now join me in giving a very warm welcome to my colleague, Matt Apuzo, and our very special guest, Sally Yates. not true. Um, so I thought we'd uh, I thought we'd start at the end um, and uh, and if I could take you back to when the Obama administration is ending and uh, everybody's saying their goodbyes and uh, you I guess it's tradition the, somebody stays around to keep the lights on and sign the FISA warrants and uh, um, Ooh, right to it yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there but um, but uh, so how did you get, you get picked to, to stick around for uh, the early weeks and months of the Trump administration? Well, I will get to that. First, let me thank everybody here at Georgetown and the folks at the New York Times for, for this evening. It is great to see such a big crowd here, so I'm looking forward to a good conversation with everyone. Um, and you're right, it is a tradition um, in, in the shift between administrations for the Deputy Attorney General to stay on as the Acting Attorney General until the new AG is confirmed. And it's important for a lot of reasons. Continuity is important in any agency, but the Department of Justice with its law enforcement mission and um, national security responsibilities, it's particularly important there. And so, for example, Eric Holder had done it when he was Deputy Attorney General between the Clinton and the Bush administration. And so I was glad to do it as well here. I love the department, wanted to help in the transition of that. And it's supposed to be an uneventful time. Uh, yeah, that, and, and everything went off without a hitch. Just, and, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, so obviously at this point, the new administration is coming in, and uh, the big issue uh, that comes across your desk is uh, the travel ban. The first, you know, how does that come across your desk, and what form does that take, and how do you learn about it? Um, can you just talk through the, that process? Yeah. Well, interestingly, it never came across my desk. Um, and, and when I say that this was supposed to be an uneventful time, that is part of the tradition as well, is that there's an understanding that everything just stays kind of status quo during this holdover time. And the administration, new administration, doesn't do any big things. And likewise, that I wouldn't like haul off and do some Obama era type new policies during that time either. And so it was actually the afternoon of Friday the 27th. Um, I had actually been at the White House that afternoon meeting with um, the White House counsel about, and this has been public now so I can say it, about the Mike Flynn matter. And I then left to go to the airport because I was coming home for the weekend. My husband was getting an award Saturday night so I was coming back um, to see that. And it's like five-ish in the afternoon and I'm on, in the car on the way to the airport and I get a call from my principal deputy. Um, I was allowed to keep one, one staff person with me, a call from my principal deputy that said, after you left, I went on the New York Times website, um, <laughs> little plug there for the New York Times, went on the New York Times website, and you're not going to believe what I read. It looks like President Trump has done some sort of travel ban, and this was the first that we had heard about it. Um, no consultation, no nothing. And uh, so at what point did you get it? to review it. Well, um, really quickly. You I'm download actually, it off of the I, Times website? Actually, <laughs> actually, um, I've got my iPad out, so I immediately go online, and, and Matt is emailing me things, and I'm, you know, not I'm me, Googling. Not, not you, Matt. Not no, 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 no. My Matt <laughs> Axelrod, who is my principal deputy. And I'm literally reading it, yeah, on the iPad from the news. And, I mean, are you doing a legal review in the backseat of your car? Sure. I mean, we spent the weekend, actually, um, trying, first of all, to get our arms around what it was the administration was trying to accomplish here. 
um, because we had not been included in, in any kind of process here um, that you normally would be, where we would have a sense of what the president was trying to do and how we might be able to help him accomplish that. Um, we were looking at the document itself. There were discussions going on with the White House. Um, over the course of the weekend, there were challenges that were being filed because you know, you got to go back. This is travel ban one. We're on 3.0 now, but this was the first one. And people were literally in midair when this executive order was signed who were lawful permanent residents or people with valid visas and were being turned away at the airports when they got here. And so over the course of the weekend, we were furiously trying to determine both what the parameters were of this executive order, what they, who was in and who was out, as well as what are the legal challenges to the executive order, um, which were being filed immediately, and what are our defenses to it. And so what do you have to take in cons into consideration there, and how much does the president's words, uh, how much do those words come into play as you're trying to analyze What's our defense of this? Do we, do we have, I mean, presumably you start from the basis that you will defend it. Mm -hmm. um, and so how much, what gets considered and how much of the president's words come into that consideration? Well, in this instance, the president's words did come into consideration <clears throat> because over the course of the weekend, you know, I'm reading the challenges, getting information from my folks. I mean, normally the way DOJ is, it's a very hierarchical organization. Normally there'd be lots of memos that are done at lower levels and it would work, kind of work its way up. There wasn't time for that. You know, this is, it well, was- there wasn't any people, right? I mean, and well, there were, there were people no there, but there wasn't enough time. If they were gonna write a pretty memo for me, by the time they got all of that done, you know, we're way past the point where we have to take a position because it was Friday late afternoon when I learned about it and it was Monday then when we determined we had to take a position on the constitutionality of the executive order by the next morning because of the challenges that were being filed. We had been able to defend on procedural grounds, mainly because they were mooted out if someone was admitted. But I was told on Monday that we would have to take a position on the constitutionality of the travel ban the next morning. And so that meant we had to determine whether we believed it was constitutional or not and how we might defend that. And so that does involve obviously an examination of the relevant law, of the, the executive order itself. And in this instance, it also included looking at the words of the president, um, both during the time he was running for office and after he had been elected in terms of his articulated intent to effectuate a Muslim ban. And so, you wrote, uh, I'm not, in the email to staff, I'm not convinced that the executive order is lawful. Do you need to be convinced that it is lawful in that situation, or is it that you presume it's lawful, and unless you're pr it's proven that it's not lawful, then you don't defend it? I mean, what's the calculus on yeah, that? Yeah, and look, this was a very unusual situation, um, not just in sort of how it came to us, but also in terms of how we would defend it. As I talked with our folks through the weekend, and I was talking with people who were the career people at the Department of Justice, as well as um, the Trump appointees that were there, and then Matt Axelrod, who was, was with me as well. And as we talked through, in fact, I convened a big meeting first thing Monday morning with all of those folks in my conference room to work through, to hear from them, how do we defend against X, Y, and Z? And I can't go through sort of exactly what was said in that, because there's, there's a privilege to that, but um, it became apparent to me that to defend this, we would have to advance an argument that the travel ban had absolutely nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with that. And I didn't believe that to be the truth. And that meant, from my perspective, that we would have to advance a defense that was based on a pretext and we would be doing it not just on some tangential issue, but on really a core defining value of our country on religious freedom. And so under those unusual circumstances where the Department of Justice to defend would have to advance a pretext, that's when the statements of the president became relevant and that's when I made the decision to direct the department not to defend it. Why not let the courts sort that out? Because I mean, certainly, I mean, don't, 
don't Congress and the president, any president, uh, have an expe a reasonable expectation that if they pass something, either a law or an executive order, that you know the the Justice Department will sort of do a good faith uh, defense, and if there's a problem, then let uh, uh, let the court sort it out. I mean, you had an OLC decision that said that at least the you know the substance of this was squared away. I mean, why not just say, look, this is supposed to be an uneventful time, you know. Let's punt uh, or or resign. I mean, why not? Why not do one of those? And, and that's a fair question. And I certainly vacillated as I as I considered this between whether once I determined a that I didn't believe it was lawful, <clears throat> and secondly that to defend it would require us to advance a pretext. Then the real dilemma is: Do you stay or do you go? Um, do I just resign and say, okay, I'm not going to be part of this? or do I direct the department not to defend? And you're right that traditionally, if there's a reasonable legal argument to be made um, in defense of an executive order or an action, the department will make that argument. In this case though, by definition to me, advancing an argument that's not grounded in truth is not reasonable. And it's not something I believe that the Department of Justice should ever be doing. And so from my perspective, that's what put this in a different category. So why not, why not then just resign and say, I'm not going to defend that? The, the president has a right to have his executive order defended by somebody who believes this. It's, it's his administration. Why not just resign? Well, because that would have, in, in, from my view, that would have protected my personal integrity, but it wouldn't have protected the integrity of the Department of Justice. And I was not a lawyer in the civil division or in the Office of Legal Counsel or in some other part of the department. I was the acting attorney general of the United States. And I had a responsibility, I believed at that point, to protect again, not just my integrity, but the integrity of DOJ. And, you know, and beyond that, I, I remembered um, back at my confirmation hearing when there were a number of senators that were pushing me on the issue of what would I do if the president asked me to do something that I believed was unlawful. Um, now, they were talking about a different president at the time. It was President Obama. Um, and. Um, there was a different executive order that they were focused on at that point, but to a person, they all pushed me on, will you say no? And in fact, it was Senator Sessions who went beyond that, not just if he asked you to do something that's unlawful, if the president asked you to do something that would, I don't remember his exact words, but something that would that <coughs> undermine the integrity of the Department of Justice, something along those lines. They didn't say, if he asked you to do something like that, will you resign? They said, will you say no? And from my perspective, doing my job meant saying no. You had to know you were going to be fired when you did that, right? I, you know, I thought there's a, there's a decent chance of it, yeah. <laughs> um, but look, and you all may think that I'm just sort of crazy optimistic, but um, I also thought there was a chance I wouldn't be. Um, that, and I can tell you, I didn't want to be. I had been with the Department of Justice for 27 years, and being fired at the end of it, was not how I wanted to leave DOJ. Um, but um, I recognized that certainly there was a good chance I would be fired. I also thought that maybe they would reevaluate whether this made any sense. You know, they ultimately did withdraw the first travel ban. Um, they abandoned it. But DOJ um, did defend it. First. They, they did, yes. I mean, so was that a bad faith? I mean, do you think No, I'm not gonna, look, I think the folks at the department were in a different role than I was, the people that, that in the civil division that are charged with doing that, they had a different responsibility than I did. Uh, you, didn't get, uh, you didn't get fired by a tweet, uh, so how did that, how did that go down? <laughs> no, um, well, um, apparently they tried to fire me by email. I guess that's a step up from a tweet, um, but it bounced back initially. <laughs> they had the wrong email address. Um, I was refusing to be fired, but no, it, it bounced back, and so a letter was delivered to me. Hand delivered. Mm -hmm. um, would you do anything different if you had now? If you've sort of seen it all play out, I mean, would you um, would you do it differently? You know, I've been asked that question before, and look, it was it was 72 hours from the time I learned about this until the time I made the decision, and you know, in making a decision as momentous as this. Would I have liked to have had more time for that? Yeah. But I have to tell you, I, I don't, no, it wouldn't have changed what I did, and I don't, I wouldn't have done anything differently. I, you know, I, I didn't want to be fired, but um, 
to have done anything else to me would have felt like a betrayal of everything that I felt like the department had stood for and that I had tried to stand for during the time that I was there. Uh, since leaving the department, uh, P Politico has called you the uh, face of institutional resistance. Um, you can buy Sally Yates t-shirts. Uh, Vogue called you the hero that America needs right now. Um, how do you feel about this, and, and are, you, are you leading a resistant effort? I mean, where, how do you see yourself? I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, there are, I mean, you see resist bumper stickers. I mean, I, uh, um, I mean, where do you see yourself fitting into that? Well, look, I mean, there are folks out there have been very generous, but I, I don't view myself as a hero at all. Um, and this is not in an aw shucks kind of way. It's, um, I did my job. Um, that's not being a hero. And there's an old Southern expression, you know, you don't congratulate a man for not robbing a bank. I also don't think that you necessarily canonize someone for doing his or her job either. And that's what I felt like I did there. In terms of whether, um, you know, a leader of the resistance. No, I, I didn't view that as an act of resistance. What now, about now, am I troubled by some of the actions of the administration? Um, yes. Do I speak out in selective ways about those? Sure, I do. Um, I think that this is not a time for us to admire the issue, but rather to stand up and to speak out about those things that we think are wrong or unjust. And I don't do it. You know, I'm not doing a running commentary of the administration. I'm not, you know, tweeting my every thought. Um, but I am trying to to speak out when there are times where I feel like I have something to add to the discussion. You uh, you wrote an op-ed on the on this topic in the Times. Uh, While we are busy staring at the wreckage of Attorney General Sessions' relationship with the man he supported for president, something more insidious is happening. The president is attempting to dismantle the rule of law, destroy the time-honored independence of the Justice Department, and undermine the career men and women who are devoted to seeking justice day in and out. Like I said, I'm speaking out sometimes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, you're not leading a resistance, is that what we said? Um, uh, so then what are you, when you, when you write those, what are you, what are you, no, no, what are you speaking you say, out about? I mean, what is it specifically that is, you say you're troubled. Yeah. What is it specifically that you're troubled by? Um, and what are you speaking out about? Now, when I said, look, I don't consider myself a leader of the, I mean, I'm not even exactly sure what that means. Uh, you know, I'm, I certainly am speaking out about things that I think are troubling that are going on in the administration. If that makes me part of the resistance, then so be it. But that's, that's not like a career goal of mine to be, you know, <laughs> like a, a leader of the resistance. With respect to that, I mean, that's something actually that, um, it's one of the things that worries me the most. I mean, there are lots of policy decisions that are made by this administration with which I disagree. Um, but elections have consequences, and I think you have to expect in a change in administrations, a change in party, that there are gonna be um, policy decisions that are made that you don't think are a good idea. Um, what worries me more than any of that is the relentless attack on democratic institutions and norms, and the impact that that can have on our country, not just during uh, the term of a Trump presidency, um, but in the years to come as well. Because you know, with this sort of barrage that we experience every day and, and a defense mechanism, if nothing else, we tend to normalize this because it's kind of exhausting to stay in a state of constant outrage, but um, one of the things that I've been most concerned about is the president's attempted interference at the Department of Justice. You know, the rule of law is essential to our democracy, and that requires that decisions about criminal cases be made on the facts and the law and nothing else. And that's why through Democratic and Republican administrations alike, you know, at least since Watergate, there has been a time-honored norm that the White House stays completely away from criminal investigations or prosecutions, has absolutely no involvement. You know, what's happening here with the president tweeting and calling and, you know, it seems like if not weekly, almost daily sometimes, um, interference there, whether that actually has an impact on the decisions that are made at DOJ or not, the damage is done 
by the public's loss of confidence that the Department of Justice is acting independently and is making those decisions based on facts and law and nothing else. You, uh, you said interference by the White House. I mean, are you, I mean, are, is, that a, is that a political analysis? I mean, is that a legal analysis? Is there, I mean, is there, is interference obstruction? I mean, what are we, what are we talking about here when you say interference? I mean, are there specific things that are, that you're talking about? Well, I don't think that there's a, a crime in the federal code called interference, but I hear, here's what I would, I mean, I'm not referring to whether it's criminal conduct on the part of the president. I'm referring to everything from calling the attorney general, for example, and trying to get him to drop the criminal prosecution of Sheriff Arpaio. Um, that's interfering in a criminal process or attempting to interfere in it. Um, calling- the I mean, does the president have that authority I mean, we could say it's time-honored norms that you don't do that, but does mm -hmm. the president have that authority? Ultimately, does the attorney general get his authority from the president? Does the president not have the authority to do that? The pre certainly, the Department of Justice is part of the executive branch. There's no question about that. Um, and so if, if the question to me is not whether he has the legal authority do, to do it. That's where the norms that or, you know, really form the fabric of how the rule of law operates is so essential. The fact that he may have the legal authority to ask the attorney general or direct the attorney general to do it doesn't mean that it's a good idea or that it's consistent with the rule of law and how our country operates or yeah. has operated. I mean, if we're talking about norms, I mean, norms change over time, right? Uh, is, there, is, there any legal, is there any legal problem uh, have you seen the president crossing any sort of legal uh, lines in terms of interference? Uh, or I mean, are you just troubled by, not just troubled, or are you troubled more by uh, what you see as like an erosion of the, of the norms that have been built up around DOJ? Yeah, look, I'm not making a judgment about <clears throat> whether there is a criminal case to be made on the president based on um, his attempted interference in a criminal process, whether it's, you know, the, the regular calls to, you know, jail a former political rival or, um, comments that he makes about those that he thinks the Department of Justice should not be pursuing. That, that's not my point here. The point is, is that the rule of law requires independence of the Department of Justice, and the president is not respecting that independence. Um, you'd mentioned uh, becoming the leader of the resistance wasn't your career goal, which seems like a nice segue to uh, you know, are you interested in running for something? I mean, you're, uh, <laughs> I mean, um, that's, uh, when I told people I was doing this, everybody said, well, ask her what she's running for. Um, you know, I, you know, I can't see that, um, to be honest with you. I, you know, I believe in public service. I've stayed at DOJ for almost 30 years. Um, but running for office is just not anything I've ever felt drawn to. Like, full stop, close the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I did the full stop, close the door a couple of times before when I was asked this, and my husband said, please just don't say never. Please just in this, because he wants me to. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so for my husband's sake here, I'll say, I can't see it. I can't imagine that that would ever happen. But for Comer's sake, I'm, I'm not saying absolutely never, right. but it's pretty darn close to that, yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the substantive changes, uh, and I'll throw out a couple that, that have been pretty newsworthy. Um, in the civil rights arena, uh, the Attorney General uh, said that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act does not extend to gay and transgender people. Uh, the AG reversed the policy, uh, the bathroom policy, as I guess has been shorthanded about, access to facilities in public schools uh, for transgendered students. Um, how did you react to that and how significant uh, of, a, of a change is that from the Obama administration to now and how should people read that change? Um, you know, I think it's part of the um, series of changes that have been made with respect to DOJ's approach to civil rights. Um, I wasn't entirely, I was disappointed by that, but I can't tell you that I was shocked by it. Um, I, I think that Attorney General Sessions is doing what we would have expected that he would do, given the positions that he took when he was senator. And if the Attorney General reads the Civil Rights Act uh, to say that uh, the prohibition against sex discrimination does not extend mm -hmm. to gender identity, and that that's a if that's his fair reading of the law, right. it, 
that is his lead. This is presumably the same sort of, I have to search my, you know, search myself and figure out what the right move is here. Um, that's not, that's not unlawful. That is totally in his authority to do. No, I mean, if that's how he reads it, yes. And I, I don't. Do you have any? Oh, and I don't have yeah. any reason to doubt that that's genuinely what he believes. And do you think ultimately that you know the courts are going to be forced to take that up? I mean, because. Um, who knows? I don't know that I'm a better predictor on that than anybody else. Um, in the criminal justice reform space, yeah. which is uh, I know something that you spend a lot of time on, uh, you did a lot especially in the last 18 months on, on uh, prisons and education and rehabilitation. Uh, you push for more clemency uh, applications uh, and, and you push hard up on Capitol Hill, but, but the, the laws on mandatory minimums stayed the same. A lot of those drug war era sentencing laws are still in place that you work to undermine. Um, does that, is that moment passed? Do you think? I don't think so. I mean, this is, um, criminal justice reform and sentencing reform specifically that you're talking about there is one of the few issues out there on which there is truly bipartisan support. I mean, you've got everybody from the Koch brothers on the right to the ACLU on the left that recognize that we need to recalibrate um, our sentencing laws, particularly for lower level nonviolent drug offenders. Now, people come at this for different reasons. Um, some folks come at it purely from a fiscal standpoint that we simply can't afford to keep incarcerating people at the levels that we are right now. You know, 5% of the world's population, 25% of its prisoners. Um, the BOP has grown almost 800% since the early 80s, in large part because of drug offenders. Um, so there's, there was broad bipartisan support passed out of Senate Judiciary Committee. We just couldn't get a vote on the Senate floor. Uh, I think there's a good chance it would have passed then. Now, I have no idea what's going to happen now. The, the Justice Department is very strongly opposed to sentencing reform. But I'll tell you what I think is going to happen, and that is change in the states. You know, we're already seeing broad consensus in the states. 30 states already have enacted some type of meaningful criminal justice reform. Red states and blue states. And far more individuals are impacted by state systems than by the federal system. So normally you kind of like the feds to be out front and to be leading and the states could follow. But in this instance, I think we're going to have to look to the states to be the ones on, on the front. So on it, the does, edge. it does sound like you do think for at least for this moment, the window at the federal level kind of has closed on, on sentencing reform. I, you know, I, I, again, the, ever the optimist, I would like to hope um, that that's not the case. I know, for example, Senator Grassley is, is pushing it out of his committee. Um, maybe it'll get to the floor this time for a vote. Um, and I think that the votes might be there. It's hard to picture when the administration's own Justice Department is so adamantly opposed to it that that's going to happen. Well, they, um, I mean, the but, but that's kind of an outlier position. I mean, lots of conservative Republicans support sentencing reform. And the position of, of Attorney General Sessions and the position of the Justice Department is really an outlier even from conservative Republicans. But Sessions would say that, that that's a problem not, that's not his problem, that's, that's your problem. Because he will say, I was a US attorney in Mobile during the, the battle days of the crack, crack epidemic and, and um, Democrats and Republicans got together and they passed these mandatory minimums, they passed tough on uh, crime laws and the crime rates went down. And now that the crime rates are, rates are down, everybody's forgetting what those bad times were like. Uh, I mean, so why, why should we roll back, why should we roll back mandatory minimums now uh, at a time when in some cities you're starting to see crime tick back up. Yeah, and, and we have. I mean, first, um, violent crime rates are still at historically low levels. <clears throat> They're like half what they were when I became an AUSA back in 1989. There certainly have been upticks in some cities, and I think that we need to be really attentive to that and vigilant, but I don't think anybody can really reasonably argue that the reason why violent crime rates have gone up in some cities is because we're not sending enough drug defendants to prison for long enough. I mean, we are in the middle of a, of a heroin epidemic or an opioid epidemic. Right. Um, uh, I mean, Sessions has said on a number of occasions that uh, if you take uh, dangerous people off the streets, they're not there to kill people. Um, and so, you know, 
why, why now? Why at this point when you, you do see that, even though there are historic lows, you start to see that, that uptick, why now? Because I think you would need to make a correlation between drug offenses and an uptick in violent crime to say that the answer to that is to once again go out and fish with the net instead of with the spear and say we're going to take all drug defendants and send them to prison for longer than necessary for public safety purposes. And I actually think those kind of actions make us far less safe and not more safe because every dollar that you're spending, sending that lower level nonviolent drug offender to prison for longer than he or she needs to be there is money that you don't have to spend on more serious offenders. It's money that you don't have for more cops on the street. It's money that you don't have for prevention. It's money that you don't have for prison reform that's absolutely essential for reducing recidivism. So it, you know, it may make for a nice sound bite and rhetoric to scare people, but I don't believe that that's actually what makes our community safer. The White House has put out its principles for prison reform, um, mm -hmm. and it said uh, that it supports uh, expanded educational opportunities in prison and uh, recidiv anti-recidivism programs to help ease the transition back into society. Uh, this is an area you worked a lot on. What do you make of that, the proposals, and uh, you know, what, what chance do you think they have? Well, I haven't seen any proposals from the White House. Principles. Um, principle. The principles I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, and that's one of the reasons why in the last two years of the administration, we really undertook some really significant reform and changes at BOP, particularly in the area of prison education, um, to the point of beginning the creation of a semi-autonomous school district within the Bureau of Prisons, bringing in a woman who had been involved in the um, state prison system in Texas and very successful there with education to um, essentially create individualized education programs for each inmate when he or she comes in. The way things are right now, the only real education program that is offered by the Bureau of Prisons is a GED prep program. That's it. There's really nothing systemically offered for high school diplomas. There's nothing for those who um, can't read, who are, have literacy issues. There's nothing for, for those who have learning disabilities, and there's very little in terms of post-secondary education. And so our initiative would have changed all of that and had a pilot program set up to go because right now there's a waiting list over 15,000 inmates long just to get into the GED prep program. And if you're lucky enough to get into that, you know what you get? An hour a day of instruction, that's it. Because of budget constraints, they don't have the staff to be able to devote more to education. So being more creative in a blended model where you can work through tablets and online education in addition to classroom instruction is really essential. So you know, that was a, we felt like a really good first step that, that was then undone almost right out of the gate. They pulled the plug on that. And look, if they've got a better idea, I am all for that. I've got no pride of authorship in any of this. But just pulling the plug on things and not having a re replacement for it, you know, it's easy to say, you know, I'm for prison reform and I'm for prison education and programming. It's a lot harder to actually do it. Um, in, uh, to ask some off the news questions. Uh, Look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Recently, uh, you may have read the president declassified the fact that uh, you uh, and some of your successors in the Trump administration applied for and received a FISA warrant for Carter Page, uh, Trump campaign aide. Can you, and this is being obviously reviewed now by the DOJ Inspector General, can you assure the American people that this was done entirely by the book? Yeah, well first I'm not gonna go into details on that because it is being reviewed by the Inspector General. But I have absolutely no reason to believe that anything inappropriate was done in connection with the FISA warrants during the time that I was there. Obviously don't know what happened after I left, but I have no reason to believe that anything untoward would have been done by my successors or, or other folks who were there in the FBI or DOJ um, during, the, during the Trump administration Nothing time. was withheld from the, from the uh, FISA And I'm not going to get into I mean, just, I mean the, process, the process was followed. I mean, this has been referred to, and you've been called out by name, this has been referred to on the Hill as FISA abuse, and this is being held up as an example that uh, the government can't be trusted to, uh, to be honest with the courts. And mm -hmm. I think 
you know, the, the public wants to know, uh, you know, was there politicization of the politicization of this process? Look, I, and again, I'm not gonna get into the details, but I can tell you that the career men and women and the, what they're called political appointees, the people in positions like attorney general, deputy attorney general, head of NSA, the career men and women of DOJ and the FBI, who are the ones who initiate FISAs, not from, not from the top, but from the bottom up, um, take the obligations that they have incredibly seriously and for a FISA to make its way to the director of the FBI or to the deputy attorney general or attorney general for presentation then to a judge to review goes through many, many layers of review and in excruciating detail. And folks are very, very careful and serious about that process. You don't have any concerns then about, the, about how this I review don't, comes out on your behalf? As you, as I, as I don't know of anything. You never know what you don't know. Sure. but. I don't know of anything that gives me any concern. And no politicization, you never saw any politicization. Oh gosh, no, no. Um, you know, there are people on the, on the other side who would flip it around and say, you know, why the department and its components had so much to say in 2016 about the Hillary Clinton uh, email investigation. And yet people went to the polls and they knew almost nothing about what we now know is this massive counterintelligence investigation. Um, why, why did that happen and did, did, should people have known more? And was there any obligation on the, at the Justice Department to make sure that they knew more? No, you know, that's um, <clears throat> a policy and practice of the Justice Department that applies whether you're talking about a race for local sheriff or whether you're talking about President of the United States. And that is that you do not take actions that will unnecessarily impact an election. You certainly don't go out and start talking about investigations that you were not able to resolve before election day. So folks were very careful to make sure that actions were being that were being taken in connection with with that investigation um, did not become public. But I think I think there's square that for me. Uh -huh. uh, you know, yeah. I do recall there being some news coverage yeah. of. Uh, <laughs> Of, of, the, of, of the Clinton investigation yeah. um, while it was ongoing in October. Right. I mean, so square that for me. I mean, I think people, I, yeah. I think others have, have sort of wrestled with that issue. Yeah, and as we talked about before this, and I had indicated to you that I can't talk about the Clinton investigation while that's still under, the Inspector General is reviewing Director Comey's actions in that, and, and I can't talk about it until after that's over. Um, I'm, uh, I'm told we can take questions. Uh, questions have question marks at the end. Uh, so um, so uh, I will, uh, there are people wandering about with microphones and I think we're opening it to the students first. And uh, please remember that question mark at the end and let's just keep it as brief as possible so we can get to as many people as possible. Although you would eat time if you, if you made a speech. So I got a okay. lot more yeah. questions though. <laughs> Uh, so I can't see anything, so there's a one down here, I guess. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm curious if you believe that um, it would be, if it would be an uh, impeachable offense for uh, President Trump to take the steps to uh, fire Special Counsel Mueller, and if he did so, um, do you believe that his findings would be made public to the American people in any way? Thank you. Um, as to whether it's an impeachable offense or not, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I am a scholar on, on impeachment and what the standards are there. Um, I think it would be a huge problem for our country if he fired uh, Director Mueller. Um, and I think that, that that has been messaged to him, even from members of his own party, that, you know, look, we're not talking about some you know, tangential issue here. We're talking about the issue as to a foreign adversary's a attack on our democracy. And who was involved in that, if anyone, in the Trump campaign or the president himself? You know, those are issues we need to get to the bottom of and whether Congress would ultimately impeach him if he were, if, if he took such an action, 
Um, you know, it's hard for me to predict what Congress will do. Um, but, I mean, the House is for stating the obvious. That would be a bad thing. <laughs> this. Can, as a, uh, we'll ask you to put your constitutional law uh, uh -huh. scholar hat on. Uh -uh. Can, in, a, in a general uh, matter, as a general matter, can a, do you believe a sitting president can be indicted? You know, I know that there's an OLC opinion that indicates that he cannot. Um, you know, I'm not in this business anymore, so I haven't actually even read that opinion to know the answer to that. I know that there are also, and have read that there are scholars out there that dispute that. I think the opinion is from 2005, sometime. Yeah, um, and I mean, yeah. I think it's been amended yeah. over time. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Do we have other questions? I think we have one back there. Hi, thank you very much for coming to speak with us today. I was just wondering, so the White House recently announced that they would be adding, a, or, or the Census Bureau recently announced that they would be adding a question about citizenship to the US Census and whether or not the person taking the census is a citizen of the United States or not. And right now, 17 states and six cities have brought a lawsuit to the executive branch um, saying that that is unconstitutional. I was wondering if you had any comments about that, whether it is unconstitutional and what kind of impact that would have. Thank you. Yeah, you know, this is, I'm 0 for 2 now on, on having a legal answer for you. Um, I'm glad we didn't do this for the Supreme Court. God, no kidding. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, I don't, I, again, I, I'm, you know, call me crazy, but as a lawyer, I like to actually research and study something before opining on whether it's constitutional or not, and I have not um, studied this. It's clearly not a good idea, and you only have to go to the Census Bureau, who just recently made clear that this was a terrible idea to be asking this question, to know that, that, that this is not good policy. Other questions? Some down here, a bunch down here. Um, oh. Hi, uh, I was just wondering what advice you would have for young people who are interested in going into public service but might be okay. discouraged by uh, this current administration's constant attacks on the country's democratic institutions. Okay, first thing I'm gonna say is go. Um, you need to go into public service. And you know, it's interesting, I've been speaking at a fair number of colleges and universities, and I can count, usually, I'm gonna get that question within the first five questions. Um, uh, of the Q&A portion. And um, I get why you may be um, discouraged from going into public service right now. Um, but here, here's what I would tell you is, if we lose the pipeline of bright, talented, dedicated people who are willing to serve their country and go into government service, that is gonna have an impact way beyond the term of the Trump administration. Um, I also think that, you know, career service is supposed to mean that we have a broad cross-section of political views in our career ranks. We're a lot stronger when that's the case. You don't want all a bunch of lefties or a bunch of people on the right. You want people from all across the political spectrum in public service. Now, you may want to think about where you go. Um, if you feel strongly about voting rights, this might not be the time you want to go to the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. But, and I think you may also want to think about what your lines are. Um, you know, there's a difference between thinking that a policy of the administration is not a good idea, not something that you would suggest. That's different from something that you believe is wrong or unlawful or unconstitutional. You need to know, sort of know what that line is and when you might go as a result of that. But I happen to believe that all of us in our lives have an obligation to do some kind of public service. And that doesn't mean everybody has to go work for the government. There's lots of ways to do that public service. But I think all of us, as just as Americans, have an obligation to do something to make this a better place. And your country needs you right now, so I would say go. Other questions? We have some down here, over there. Hi. Uh, you spoke a little bit about norms. I was just wondering what you think, like how Donald Trump has changed or damaged norms as far as like democratic institutions and just like your opinion on that. Yeah, I think, um, how long do we have for this? <laughs> this you know, I think that he's, 
attempted to change the norms dramatically. You know, we already talked a little bit about the rule of law in the Department of Justice. Um, another institution would be independent courts. Um, think about sort of the attacks that we've, that we've heard from him on judges with whom he disagrees, not just saying that he disagrees with their decision, but attempting to undermine the very legitimacy of the court. And in one instance, you know, even accusing a, a judge of, of racial bias in, in a decision. You know, that has a really corrosive impact, I think, on, on the public's confidence in, in the justice system there. Um, how about a free press? You know, it's one thing, again, to disagree with, with particular stories that may be out there, but um, questioning, again, the very legitimacy of a free press that's absolutely essential to our democracy and to, to holding people accountable, again, I think that's really corrosive. Now, is it corrosive to the point that it changes the country, or, or are we elastic enough to kind of bounce back after this? Um, I want to believe that we are, but from my perspective, the only way that we are is if we stay vigilant and we don't normalize these things. Um, that other thing that called truth, you know, that to me is a really important norm as well. And uh, again, with, with the daily barrage of things that, that aren't just spin, but are just demonstrably untrue, um, public officials have lied to us in the past, but at least usually then they were kind of sheepish about it. Um, you don't even get that sense now. I mean, we, we ought to debate policies, but those, that debate has to be based on common facts. And those common facts can only come when we are given the truth. I just wanted to know what you thought about um, tying quotas to federal immigration judges' annual performance reviews that came out in the last couple of days. Yeah, I saw that, and I don't know enough about sort of what their thought process was there. As a prosecutor, I get nervous anytime you start talking quotas, like a number of indictments that you need to bring or cases that need to be resolved by pleas. Um, you know, that can... Um, create all sorts of, of perverse incentives here, and we are talking about our justice system. Um, so that makes me really uneasy that there would be a quota of a number of cases. That being said, I understand also, though, that you know, there's a huge caseload in the immigration courts, and um, ensuring that immigration judges is productive, is, you know, that, that's certainly a legitimate goal, but having an out-and-out -out quota makes me uneasy. Maybe some more down here. Um, should marijuana be rescheduled? Um, you know, putting aside the rescheduling question. No, 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 don't put that aside. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't see that happening. I mean, so I think, you know, you can debate that if you want to, but that's gonna be congressional action and what are the chances that's gonna happen? Um, not very good. Um, to me, what, the, the better question really is, not to say your question wasn't good, but um, the better question is what's a good use of our federal prosecutive resources and is going after marijuana dealers or, or, or marijuana cases when it's not connected with cartels or gangs or large criminal organizations, is that really a good use of our resources? We didn't think so in the Obama administration, which is why we had a policy of leaving that to the states under, you know, unless there were, were other extenuating circumstances like I've just described there. Um, but that's, you know, a, a, there's a different perspective now. Hi, so you've spoken a little bit about how this administration has really already started reshaping the judiciary, especially in terms of like uh, lifetime appointments, the record number of appointments that the Trump administration is, admaki is making to the courts. And I'm wondering what you think the long-term effects of these appointments are going to be and also how legal strategies might change in the next few years for groups trying to fight back um, or, or make reform in a system that's being increasingly dominated by young conservative judges. Yeah. Um, we shouldn't be surprised by this. I mean, this is um, certainly there have been lots of appointments that have been made 
of younger judges that will last a very long time, and so you know their impact will be felt for decades. Um, but again, I kind of put that in the category of elections have consequences. You know, the you expect that the president is going to um, nominate individuals that hopefully are qualified, but also are ideologically um, somewhat in sync with the president. And I think that's going to have a huge, huge impact that folks aren't really focusing on that much right now. But we're going to feel it for a very long time. We have one here in the middle. Um. <laughs> great, great, there you go. Hi, my name is Rua, and I'm first year at the MPP school, um, and I'm from Georgia, and you said that elections have consequences, but it seems to me that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to our electoral infrastructure in general, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, because as someone coming from Georgia, we're seeing a lot of issues come out about voter servers and voter data go going missing during um, court cases, and so that seems to make me wonder how much of it do we actually have control, excuse me, control over as voters? Yeah. Well, I'm from Georgia as well. Actually, I live in Atlanta and come back and forth here. So, um, you know, I know that is a big concern. And, um, you know, I'm not sure that I have the answer to that. Um, certainly there are gerrymandering issues, for example, that are coming before the Supreme Court that I think that's going to have a huge, huge impact on, on how things work in the future. Um, and, but then you're right, individual states, our home state, of Georgia has issues, as do you know a number of other states as well. And I, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I've got the answer to that. This poor guy yeah, here on I the know. front Every row time was having, he's just there. You know, he's just... I mean, here he is on the front row, and I he know, can't get I this know. question. <laughs> it's like um, the one so, row I can see. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm also actually from Atlanta, Georgia, okay. um, and on the topic of elections, I was curious. I uh, you know. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, we're from the Cap County too, um, and so we were curious if okay, you. Okay, creeps me out. You know what county I'm from, but that's okay. <laughs> our high school. Okay. That's well, fair. well played. Just kidding. Well um, I was curious if you had any opinions and thoughts on the upcoming gubernatorial election, and if there were any candidates that really popped out to you as strong. Um, you know, there there are a lot of good candidates that are. I, I'm not going to give you an answer on this. I'll tell you. <laughs> up front. There, there there are lots of good candidates there. Yeah, and I, and I actually know several of them, which is why I'm not going to pick a favorite right now. Well, welcome to my world, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Do we maybe have time. Do we have time for uh, one or maybe two more. Great. Uh, thank you uh, for your public service. Um, a bookend to another question is: uh, the Department of Justice has a lot of uh, foreign partners around the world, and we're seeing an increasing erosion of um, the rule of law in those places. We've got backstops here, but in places like Turkey, in China, Thailand, elsewhere. Um, I was wondering if you had some comments about that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, that is, and, and we do have, look, we've got an incredibly strong democracy here, and we have a system of checks and balances that it's holding, and when I talk about the impact on democratic institutions, you know, I'm not chicken little here saying that our democracy is about to fold. That's not it. It's the erosion of trust that I think is the biggest issue here in our country. But you're right, and in other countries, it's not just a trust issue, but it's actually um, whether democracies themselves are holding. And they're actually trying to emulate some of the things going on here. You, you hear autocrats from around the world now echoing fake news when information comes out that is critical of them. Um, so, you know, they kind of see it working here and, and they're using it there. And so I think that's something that is very worrisome. I heard actually Madeleine Albright yesterday on NPR that was, was speaking um, at some length uh, about this issue. And, and I suppose that there are sort of cycles of sorts um, that, that the world goes through, but it's a troubling cycle that we seem to be in now where there's a shift to authoritarianism um, in some of those countries that are kind of teetering on the brink um, that is not just happening in one or two, but in you know, Poland, Hungary, you can, you know, Philippines, there are lots of places to, to name there where we should be concerned. All right, maybe we'll do one right over here. Yeah, uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on mens rea reform? Good question. Um, should we maybe explain that? Not yeah. everybody's a law student. Yeah, do you want to, how do you define mens rea reform? And I can tell you, I, I mean. 
I'm actually only a freshman. I'm not in law school, so you can probably explain <laughs> oh, it better than I am. Yeah. I just I just remember reading an op-ed about it a while back yeah. about how it was holding up the reform process. You know, and, and that's, um, yeah, I actually, mens rea reform, let me see if I can sort of define it. It's, um, there are some statutes that are out there that don't have um, a mens rea, meaning a, a state of criminal mind that is laid out in the statute. And for most all of those statutes that might not say what the state of mind has to be, whether it's like knowing that you are knowingly doing something or willfully, willfully being that you know that it's bad, a violation of the law to do it. If it doesn't have a, a specific intent laid out, then the courts will interpret what that intent should be. So candidly, I think the whole mens rea reform thing is much ado about not a big problem. Um, there's not been, there have been a handful of some cases where I think prosecutors used really bad judgment in the cases that they brought, and those are, are brought out as examples of why we need the reform. I think that there's an alternative now that is going forward for any statutes that are passed if they don't have a mens rea in them, then um, it would be automatically assumed to be knowing or something. I don't really have a problem with that, um, but I kind of think it's a problem. I mean, it's a solution in search of a problem. Uh, I remember when you came to Washington and we were talking at DOJ and I said, uh, I said, well, you know, you're here, but it's, uh, it's kind of, we're, we're kind of drawing the administration to a close. And you said, no, Matt, we're going to, we're going to, it's going to be busy. We're going to, we're going to do a lot. There's going to be plenty of news. And, uh, and you were absolutely right. Um, and that was before the last and two that was right. right. Yeah. And that was right. And that, right. That didn't even include the transition and, uh, and the, uh, the last, uh, the last 10 days of the administration. But, um, uh, I really appreciate you coming out. Thank you to Georgetown and to, uh, the Times Insider Group for putting this on and, uh, Sally Yates. Thanks everyone.